I'm going to be continuing in my message, church, on um, the Lamb. Last time I shared on the Lamb of God, and that's why we've headed back to that very old song. <laughs> Get a flashback, Alphonse. <laughs> Because it declares, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. And it's just been on my heart and um, that his sacrifice, the beautiful sacrifice of his body and his blood. And so this morning I want to continue on that theme of the lamb today. It's part two, I guess, but it's really just a continued thought. Um, because there's so much to draw out of the scriptures. I can never fit it into a 40 minute message or something like that. So there's just so much to draw out of the scriptures and particularly surrounding the Lamb of God and the blood covenant that we have with Yahweh. And we've been sharing on that. And if you've missed any of those messages, I wanna encourage you to go to our website, um, gracegathering.online and check out some of those and um, get filled in on what the Holy Spirit's been speaking to us as a church about. And so last time we focused in um, on the understanding that Jesus is not an afterthought. Jesus was not an afterthought in God's plan for redemption. And um, for all of humankind, he wasn't an afterthought. Sin didn't happen and then we thought, oh, I better send Jesus. He actually was before the creation of time, before the creation of the world rather. And so we saw in the book of Revelation, which I'll read in a second, how the sacrifice of the lamb occurred before sin even entered the created world. So we're going to read from Revelation 13, 8. So I want you to get a handle of this on this this morning, that Jesus wasn't the plan for after sin. Jesus was the plan before the creation of the world. And so in Revelation 13, 8, it says, And all the people who belong to this world worshipped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb, who was slaughtered before the world was made. So you can see in that scripture where I've highlighted it, to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. So before God, Creator, Elohim even spoke anything into existence. Before he created anything, we know that he spoke and said, let there be light, and he began to speak things into existence, the land and the plants and the animals and the birds and the heavenly bodies. And he spoke all of those things powerfully into existence. But before he even spoke those things into place, God outside of time, the triune God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect unity outside of time, outside of the history that we know in terms of the earth, outside of that time, outside of the restraints with an eternal perspective. Because remember, God is creator. He creates all things. So we are just created beings, and we can't comprehend this um, fully. But before, outside of all of those things were spoken into creation, outside of those things that were to come, our God creator, Elohim, had a plan. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had a plan, a purpose, that people would be in blood covenant with him. And before the creation of all of those things that we see around us today, and even humans, God's plan in perfect unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we read in that scripture says, to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. He had a plan for you and I. He had a plan for Jesus. Jesus was not an afterthought. Sin entered into the garden. Oh dear, I better bring someone to rescue them. Before any of that, our God, our powerful, all-knowing, outside of time creator had a plan. And his plan was to send at the appointed time, was to send Jesus. He prepared a body for Jesus in the appointed time in history. He sent Jesus. And he had a plan that was to bring us out of bondage before 
the bondage even came. Can you comprehend that, church? So outside of time, God in his perfect unity, triune God, the world's not yet created, yet he had a plan of sending Jesus at the appointed time in history to save us from something that had not yet happened. This is our God. He is bigger than we realize, church. This is Elohim creator. Before sin even entered into time itself, because remember God is eternal outside of time, before sin in the garden even entered in, God had a plan. I will redeem them back with a blood covenant. I will make a covenant with humankind. And at the appointed time in history, the Bible tells us, I'll read it a little bit later, at the appointed time in history, God prepared a body for Jesus. Before creation, and that scripture tells us, before the world was made, the lamb was slaughtered. Jesus, God, uh, Jesus the Son, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit in perfect unity had a plan. A plan to be in covenant with you and me, a plan to see people rescued, saved from the bondage of sin that was to come. He had a plan. That's how much our God loves us. And I want you to remember, church, that our God is greater. Whatever you are going through, our God is greater. Our God is greater. Whatever the situation family members are going through, our God is greater. His plans and purposes are unfathomable. It's even hard for us to think about outside of time that God would think about me. I want to see me in relationship with him. Outside of the creation of the world, he thought of me, he thought of you, he thought of our loved ones. And I love the scripture that talks about when Jesus actually came into that appointed time and he endured the cross, but before that it says in the scripture, it says he saw the joy set before him to endure the cross. What does that mean? It means outside of time. He knew where he was going to come into history in, a, in the form of a body. The triune God, the Son of God, saw you, the joy set before him. And he followed through to the cross because he saw you and he wanted you, beloved child of God. And so we need to remember, church, that our God is greater, so much greater and so if we see him as that greater God, then we can ask him for the greater things. And we can walk and trust in our uh, walk with him and have faith for the greater things. And we can see greater things as we walk knowing our God is greater. Our God is greater. Don't have a small picture of who he is. He is Elohim, creator. And we are the created beings. We are small and insignificant <laughs> compared to him. So God himself, and I love this. We talked about this last time. God himself provided the sacrifice, provided the lamb. The three in one, God himself outside of time knew what was going to happen because he is all-knowing. He knew what was going to happen when he created the world. It didn't shock him. It did not come by surprise. And so God himself provided the sacrifice for the blood covenant with humanity. God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, yes, we've got a plan. It'll be down the track. But I have a plan and it's going to be a blood covenant with people, with all of humanity. 
So God the Father himself provided the lamb by sending his son Jesus, and yet he was the lamb. He provided the lamb as the father, yet he was the lamb as the son. And it was only by the Holy Spirit that raised him back to life that things were completed in the covenant. So we see God himself, the triune God himself, provided the lamb, the lamb that is worthy. Amen. So God himself, three in one, in perfect unity and communion with one another, provided a way for you and me to be in fellowship with him. He saw you before he spoke things into existence. And that just blows my mind. (laughs) That he saw me and he said, I want to be in fellowship with you. I want to be in covenant with you. I want you to be my child. Who am I? to be that but this is the heart of God this is the heart of our God so since the first sacrifice in the garden of Eden we talked a little bit about this last time when sin did enter into this time and space that we call earth into the history in the garden of Eden sin entered into um, into the world At that particular time, we know that Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves and God said, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to be enough. And then he he covered them with animal skins. And that is the first outward sign of that blood covenant that God thought about. I'm going to send my son. And the first outward sign, the first sacrifice, the first shedding of blood occurred in the garden. And that was the first time we learn about the blood covenant as an outward covering. I want you to remember that outward covering. And it shows the heart of the Father. Because the Bible tells us that when we sin or when there is sin, that once there is sin, there should be death. And so when Adam and Eve sinned against God, according to the justice of the holiness of God, Adam and Eve should have been put to death because God is a judge. There is a justice to him. And so the punishment for sin is death. And so we read about that in Romans. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. So when I sin, I should be put to death. That is what should have happened in the garden. Adam and Eve should have been put to death. But that's not the heart of God. God said, by my holiness, by my justice, yes, I have every right to put Adam and Eve to death because of sin. But God said, I remember the blood covenant. I remember that I am Yahweh, covenant-keeping God, and my heart is for people. My heart is for all of humankind. And so God didn't put them to death. Instead, he clothed them in animal skins. He sacrificed an animal, most probably a lamb. And he clothed them with the blood. And what the blood does, it it covers. It covers sin. There was a death for sin. And the death wasn't on Adam and Eve. The death was on the lamb. The death covered the sin. So when there is, it says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So where there is sin, there is always death. But what I love about God is that his heart for people. And so yes, in Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. But if we read the next part of the scripture, you'll see our beautiful God. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So in the garden, he covered them in animal skins. He covered them in, in, as a way of saying, yes, I'm going to take care of you in terms of a covenant. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. But he did the same thing through Jesus. He offered us a free gift a covering better than an animal, a 
perfect sacrifice once and for all, for all of humankind. So instead of having Adam and Eve put to death, which he should have done because he is holy, righteous and just, he instead covered them and set in motion that blood covenant we've been talking about. And um, that plan, as I said, was conceived outside of time. <laughs> what was happening there? Outside of time. And when I was thinking about that, um, God said to me this word, sown. S-O-W-N, sown. And um, I kind of tried to find another word to fit into there. He said, no, it's not that, it's this, sown. So even though the plan was conceived outside of time, God, that word sown, it was at that point in time when he covered Adam and Eve with his skins that um, Jesus was sown into the history of the world. I want you to think about that for the moment. So he covered Adam and Eve with the animal skins. There's an outward sign of the blood covenant and God wants you to understand this morning that he's not an afterthought, that Jesus was not an afterthought. It is exactly at that point of time in history where he covered them with the blood covenant that Jesus was sown into the history of the world. Remember, sowing and reaping in the Bible is huge. We read it everywhere. But who made up sowing and reaping? Creator. Creator made the seasons and the times of harvest and sowing. And so the Holy Spirit really put that word in, in perspective for me there, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit today, that Jesus was not an afterthought. Jesus was sown like a seed. He was sown into the history of the world. An interesting concept. And I, would, I know that God wants you to really understand. Like a farmer sows a seed and expects a harvest, God sowed Jesus into the history of the world and expected a kingdom harvest. He sowed the blood covenant into the world and he expects a kingdom harvest. He expects that there will be people who will receive that salvation and will become his people. He sowed it in like a farmer sows so that the, the plans and the purpose of God will come to pass, that there would be fruitfulness. And I love the scripture, which I will share, is saying how he prepared a body he prepared a body for Jesus. So the Holy Spirit led me to the passage of Scripture when he talked to me about that sown into history. And it's in 1 Corinthians 15, and it talks about the resurrected body. It's telling believers about what will happen in the resurrection of their body and what happens, and there's lots of questions in there. So we're going to read from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35 to 38. But if we read it in terms of Jesus' body being sown into history... It was planted. His body was planted into an appointed time in history, ready for a harvest. And church, we are in the church age. We should be expecting a harvest of what Jesus' body sowed into history. Are you getting it, church, that Jesus' body, when he cried and he, on the cross, it is finished. His body and his blood that was broken, his body that was broken and his blood poured out, was sown into history. And the harvest time is now. From that point on when he rose and went back to heaven, the harvest is ripe. There is opportunity for salvation and we should be expectant of a harvest because I know that God is expectant because outside of time, he had a plan and a purpose. He was not an afterthought. He sowed Jesus' body into the plans and purposes of this world. And we should be expecting fruitfulness 
from his sacrifice. So let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 38. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Think about that in terms of Jesus' body. God sowed Jesus' body into history. And it says there, what kind of body will they come? How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Our Saviour died and then came back to life. God sowed into history. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. So outside of time, our triune God thought of a plan, and in the appointed time in history, he sowed a seed. He sowed a seed of the blood covenant to come. And then... When Jesus came at the appointed time, the covenant was established with him, a new covenant, a better covenant. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. I love that God hides little things. I just kind of little, had a little chuckle to myself when I read that because he just talks about wheat or of something else. <laughs> our Jesus, or of something else. <laughs> we planted Jesus. But God gives it a body as he has determined. God determined the appointed time for Jesus. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. God sowed blood covenant, Jesus' body, into the history of the world. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. Jesus, as the triune God, is a heavenly body. And outside of time, he had a plan as the triune God. But we know he came to earth in an earthly body. Our God came to earth in an earthly body. So there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. Jesus as a triune God came in an earthly body. There are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. God's giving us a clue about the resurrection. So will it be, be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. We know that Jesus' body died. His earthly body died. It was perishable. But what I love about the heavenly body, it is raised imperishable. So he's showing us that he sowed his heavenly body into an earthly body. Verse 43 there. It is sown in dishonor. And we know what Jesus went through at the cross. We know how much dishonor was brought onto him in his earthly body. But as the heavenly body... It is raised in glory, as one day you will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. Jesus is the king, and he could have come as the king of kings, but we know he came in an earthly body. He was born in a stable. He was raised by poor parents. He could have come in all his glory. So he was sown in weakness in terms of the world. But what I love is that he is raised in power. His body was sown in weakness, but it was raised in power. It, it is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. 
If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So I love that God hides little treasures in these scriptures. And we can just read that passage and think, yeah, it's talking about something else. But God hides little treasures if you're seeking for them and he explains to you little things that make sense to you if you're studying the word. So Jesus, as the triune God, as the second person of the triune God, was sown into the history of the world. He was sown into an earthly body. But we know that he no longer is just an earthly body. That he is a spiritual body, just like we will one day when we're redeemed. Back to him, up into heaven. Let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So here God is comparing the two. We've been looking at Adam as he was um, birthed from the dust of the ground and the spirit breathed into him. He was a living being. But the last Adam, the last Adam is Jesus. He was a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Remember, outside of time, our triune God, Jesus the Son, he is from heaven, and he came into a lowly earthly body. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I want us just to stop on that slide, that scripture for the moment. Because we know before we receive Jesus into our life, we know that we are sinners. We are from the bloodline of Adam, the earthly man. And so it says there, just as we have borne the image of the earthly man. Before we, was, we are sinners and we ask Jesus into our life, we receive the sacrifice and we become just like the heavenly man. We become just like Jesus. We become heavenly spiritual people with an eternity in heaven. And when I was looking at that scripture, we can just kind of pass over it, but um, it says, born of the image, and then also we shall bear the image. And we know that um, we, in the garden, we'll read that scripture next and come back to that one. In the garden in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, it says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image. So you are made in God's image. And in verse 27 it says, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. So we know that we were created in God's image in the beginning. And that image, of course, because of sin, we were bearing the image of the earthly man, Adam. But... Today we bear the image of our beautiful Jesus. Now when I looked at that word born or bear, it actually has an interesting meaning because it means to wear or to be clothed. And what did God do in the garden? He clothed Adam and Eve with animal skins. So from the very beginning, God clothes us. He clothes us with an outward sign of the covenant I have with these people. They are wearing animal skins. They are wearing the blood covenant. They are wearing those kind of clothes. And that's the old covenant, an outward sign. They, from the beginning, from Adam all the way through history with the Israelite people, sacrifice after sacrifice, all they were doing were clothing themselves outwardly with the blood. Clothing themselves out, outwardly with the blood. We, as uh, sinners and under the old covenant, 
We were wearing blood-stained clothes. As an outward sign, we are in covenant with God. But when Jesus came, so that's the earthly image that we wear. But when Jesus came, we are no longer clothed with that blood-stained garment. We are clothed in white robes of righteousness. And so we are no longer to bear the blood-stained clothes of the old covenant. We are to bear or to carry, to wear the clothes under the new covenant of grace. We are robed in pure white clothing. Before, under the old covenant, there was a clothing that was visible, blood-stained clothing. I'm in covenant with Yahweh, and he sees the blood, and I'm in covenant, and there's a covering and and a protection. These are my people. But under the new covenant of grace, after Jesus' sacrifice, the covenant became a new covenant. And no longer am I wearing blood-stained clothes on the outside. I am not wearing blood-stained clothes on the outside. I am wearing a white robe a dazzling white robe, whiter than snow. I am robed in righteousness because of the blood that was poured out for me on the cross and because I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. I no longer wear blood-stained clothes as an outward appearance. Yes, I'm in covenant with Yahweh. I now have an inward covenant with Yahweh. His name is Jesus. When I accept the blood and the body of Jesus, he seals me with the Holy Spirit, and I wear a robe of righteousness. And so no longer, as it says there, am I clothed in the image of an earthly man. I am clothed in the image of a heavenly man. And his name is Jesus. So church, we need to be mindful that we don't jump back to wear blood-stained clothes. We need to be mindful that we are walking in our identity and with the authority that I am a beloved child of God. I have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. I am robed in righteousness and I lift up my head and I declare victory over every situation. No longer are we to walk between covenants, sometimes in churches we jump between. God says, walk in the victory that I purchased from you, for you by my sacrifice. You are robed in righteousness, beloved child of God. Lift up your head. Walk in the victory. Go through. He made a way for you to go through, not to cower under the table but to go through whatever you're going through because Jesus lives inside of you and you are robed with his righteousness. Nothing I did, but I am robed in his righteousness. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That is you. Robed in righteousness, in a robe pure, whiter than snow, adorned as his beloved child, loved by the king. That is you. And that's all that's been happening with this blood covenant since the beginning, before time when God said, I want to have a covenant with them. It's been an outward sign for such a long time until the appointed time when the seed 
of Jesus' body sewn into history became a child, became a man, became the sacrifice, became the, um, the Lamb of God on the cross that would wash all of our sins away. That's all that's been happening with sacrifices. We read them in our Bible and we think, what on earth is going on in the Old Testament? And we think, how can I even get through these chapters in Leviticus? And I think it's heavy going. But that's all that's been happening. Blood covenant, blood covenant, outward blood covenant, blood covenant. Jesus, appointed time in history. New covenant, Lamb of God, not just a covering, an outward covering, but a taking away once and for all. Covered sin, covered sin, covered sin. Jesus came and takes away the sin of the world, washes it away, took it on his body and washes it away for us. The only way that we can be robed in those beautiful, clean, white robes is if he takes away the sin. He takes away the sin of the world. It was poured out on his body. Every sin, past, present, and future, was poured out on his body so that we could live on the other side of the cross in this church age, experiencing that sown into history, experiencing the inheritance that God has for his beloved children, experiencing the freedom in Christ. But we have to accept the sacrifice. We have to accept that Jesus' body and that Jesus' blood was enough. And when we accept the sacrifice, it's very simple. But if we accept the sacrifice, then God washes us. No more blood-stained clothes. He washes us and he sets us into eternity with him, eternal life with him. And I love that about God, that um, his beautiful heart is that he did not want people to continue under a temporal covering. He did not want people to continue to have animal sacrifices daily, daily, daily. He didn't want that temporal kind of relationship with people. He wanted an eternal relationship with people. And that's why he sowed Jesus into the history of the world. That's why he sowed the body of Jesus into the history of the world so that humanity could forever have eternity with him, could forever live in God's presence. Because without the blood, you could never enter into relationship with God. If the people under the old covenant did not have the blood covering, because God is so holy, they would die. Nobody can stand in the presence of God without the blood. Because God's holiness would cause things to perish. And that's part of the reason he sent Jesus. So that we could forever be close to him intimate with him, that we could draw near to him. So the blood of animals was a temporary fix, but the blood of the Saviour was the final sacrifice. There, are, there is no need now for any other sacrifice. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. There, was, there is no need for any more sacrifice. Jesus' body, Jesus' blood is enough. And we bear the image of the heavenly man. No longer the earthly man, but we bear the image of the heavenly man. Hebrews 10, 44 to 7 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire 
but a body you prepared for me. God prepared a body in the history of time for Jesus. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Remember the plan outside of time where Father, Son and Holy Spirit had a plan for a blood covenant before the world? Here in this scripture it says, but a body you prepared for me. And I love in verse 7 it says, here I am, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will. Jesus was sown into the history of the world. And in that scripture there it says, let me see here, when Christ came into the world, in verse 5, therefore when Christ came into the world, in the Greek there that means to enter into for an important purpose. When Christ came into the world, he came for an important plan and purpose to save humanity. He was sown into the history of the world and the body you prepared for me. I love that. The other part there where it says, it is written about me in the scroll. I love that because Jesus is the word of God. Everything is about him. He is the word of God and he is written in the scroll. Revelation 19, 13 says, He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. Jesus was not an afterthought to cover the deceiver's plan. God is so much greater than we realize, church. He is creator we are created. He is so much greater. And I love that it mentions it is written about me in the scroll because we read in Revelation about the scroll and um, that the lamb is the only one worthy to open the scroll. Worthy is the lamb. He is the only one who can save us. He is the only one that can save us, church. Worthy is the Lamb. If you think about under the old covenant, they did not have a saviour. They lived without the hope that you and I have in Jesus. They looked ahead to it, but we have him. We have the saviour of the world living inside of us. We accepted his blood and his body. We accepted the sacrifice and we have the saviour of the world living inside of us. Worthy is the lamb. Hebrews 10, 14 to 16. For by one sacrifice he was made perfect forever he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. I love that it says, after this. It wasn't under the old covenant but after this, after the sacrifice, after this sacrifice, the, when, the one that I planned and determined before the creation of time and planets and earth and everything else, after this sacrifice, I will put, I will make a covenant with them and I will put it in their hearts and on their minds. It is an internal, internal covenant now, church. 
not with outward sign of blood, but an internal blood covenant that I have with my Saviour. And it's the Holy Spirit that testifies about this. So it, it encourages us, church, to recognise that we need to understand the Holy Spirit. We need to know more about the Holy Spirit. And as we've been doing that over the past few months, as we've been learning more about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, God is leading us into these things, learning about the blood covenant, learning about worthy is the Lamb. Because it says the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this covenant we have. It's in my heart because I asked Jesus in my heart. And it's in my mind. It's not an outward covenant anymore. I want to finish with this scripture from Revelation 5.12. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Declare it with me, church. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your body and for your blood. We thank you that you were the plan from beginning. You are not an afterthought. You are the plan for the beginning, from the beginning, Lord, to save all of humankind. <laughs>